Do you see uh, upper left? Does it say recording? I yes. Need okay. So again, I'm going to pause it a few times for the breakouts. Uh, just make sure I resume <laughs> when, when we go back. Uh, I actually wrote notes for myself on the slides, so you'll probably laugh when you see those. But okay, I'm all ready to go. Um, Professor Bai, did you have some opening comments? Yeah, uh, I will be brief. Uh, my name is Jianghua Bai, a professor of Chinese at Kenyon College, uh, currently serving as a project director of the Ohio Five Mellon Language Enrichment Grant. Mm -hmm. uh, first, I would like to uh, welcome my colleagues uh, from the five colleges and Ohio State University uh, for coming here for this wonderful workshop uh, on Friday, late afternoon. Um, actually, this workshop was filled instantly. When we sent the announcement out, there was 46 on the waiting list. Mm -hmm. So uh, the reason we want to keep it small is so that we can have enough interaction and have some kind of hands-on experience applying what we learned uh, during the workshop. Uh, it is recorded, so please tell your colleagues to watch uh, the recorded uh, the, the video will be on our uh, five. Uh, so please spread the word uh, to your colleagues. And then I, I also want to uh, thank uh, Ms. Sarah Stone, the executive director of Five College of Ohio for her leadership and putting all these wonderful professional development uh, workshops together. And especially uh, to the Mellon, Mellon Foundation for funding these workshops. Uh, last but not least, uh, our special thanks go to Dr. Daniel Reed, our workshop leader today, and the title is Practical Applications of the Actual Kendo Statements in Creating Formative and Assumptive Classroom-Based Assessment. Uh, Dr. Reed is a language testing specialist at Michigan State University, uh, but she is now in the beautiful Florida instead of Michigan State. Um, as the ELC testing director, he oversees testing administration as well as research and test development in support of MSU's English exams for incoming international students. Uh, under Dr. Rhee's direction, the ELC Center provides exams that are used for the following purposes determining whether international students have met MSU's English proficiency requirements for admission, placing students into the English language classes, and evaluating the spoken English proficiency of graduate students or non-native speakers of English and the candidates for teaching assistant positions. Dr. Reed, has played major roles in the development of proficiency tests in more than half a dozen languages and has conducted research on language attitude and learning of less commonly taught languages. In addition, Dr. Reed, along with ELC director, Dr. Susan Gass, has also developed a large scale testing program in Greece in collaboration with uh, Anatolia uh, College and the American College of Greece. So now let's give a round of virtual applause to welcome Professor Reed. Thank you very much, Professor Bai, for that introduction. And thank all of you for showing up on a late Friday afternoon. Um, I heard the weather was nice, at least in Ohio. So um, um, I will say today has the potential to be interesting. I, I have just, I think a few unique ideas, but sometimes a few uh, go a long way. So um, let me begin um, by sharing my screen for the first few slides.
Okay, can you see my PowerPoint? Yes. Okay, great. So I, I won't read the title again, Professor Bai read it and you, I think, um, read it. Um, I will point out this picture um, is from the Michigan State University campus in East Lansing. Um, whoa. And I, had, I got a new computer yesterday because the other one wasn't working and this one just flips around sometimes. So um, this glass building is it's actually a new wing that was built on top of the old building that's still in operation. So the that glass building is where I normally work, except during the pandemic. Actually, I was there up until late October going in to work, but there weren't any students. So um, what, what I would like to do before we really start is um, uh, I find this um, a little difficult over Zoom. Uh, it would be great if we were in person in, in a nice room and we had snacks waiting for us and we could mingle a little. So I don't want this to get too formal. So I think one of the few chances to talk is um, right now. So I, I'm, I'll go first. I just want us to do very brief self-introductions, saying our name, the language we teach and at what school, maybe, icebreaker questions like what's your favorite level to teach and what's the most beautiful place in the world you have visited so i'm going to um i'm going to answer those but i'm going to stop sharing and stop recording momentarily so you don't have to worry about what you say and get back to the screen share and the powerpoint so Okay, so I've, I've organized today's workshop into three parts. Uh, the first part is it's sort of a review, but and I don't know how much experience you have with the actual framework. Uh, some of you may be certified testers, some of you may be less familiar, but I always find it useful. I have a lot of experience with it, but I always like to review the basics when I'm trying to apply something. So we'll start by reviewing it. And in particular, something you may not be accustomed to using the scale, not just to characterize the ability of your students, but also to characterize the ability of the tasks and activities you do in the classroom. And then how those two align um, is something you can manipulate and need to be aware of. So, um, I will share my perspective on the ACTFL framework. I'm not speaking for ACTFL. Uh, uh, I'll bring in a few language testing principles, but this is basically these are some ideas I had as I thought about what we could do in the classroom. So, um, and then we'll have a mini, mini break and uh, no more than 10 minutes, including the break part, um, because we, don't, we just don't have enough time when we come back from the break, um, we'll discuss how to design performance-based activities, activities that could uh, serve as the basis for learning and developing proficiency uh, and or assessment, the same activities. And finally, uh, part three will be the most testing oriented. Uh, I know I've been to a lot of workshops that looked at alternative assessment and exciting forms of assessment that never really got to the assessment part. And I'm, in particular, I'm thinking of when I was a graduate student, portfolio assessment was the hottest thing. And people had great ideas for collecting samples of a person's language um, production. But by the end of the workshop, we either didn't have a rubric or we had a very uh, vague rubric. So I do wanna spend some time saying how you can use a rubric create one or use an existing one in conjunction with uh, sample performances at various levels on your scale. And that can be very, very useful. So those are the things I'm aiming for. The goals correspond. So the first goal is that we end up understanding the actful principles a little better than we had uh, before. And we can design these activities. I'll show you a template and um, 
and go through the idea of rubrics and benchmarks working together. So um, let's get right into it. I'm sure you've seen this inverted period, pyramid uh, where at the bottom uh, were novices. And the more we learn, the more there is to learn. That's why it's, uh, it's ever expanding. Uh, we'll spend most of our time today on the nov in the novice and intermediate um, areas. And I should remind you, these are really broad bands of proficiency. Even when you put in the sub levels, high, mid, low, intermediate, mid is a very broad band. So you have kind of weak intermediate, mid, strong intermediate, mid. These are really ranges. Um, and uh, a basic assumption is that we can map a student onto that scale separately for different skills. So someone may be advanced in reading, uh, but maybe intermediate high in writing and so on. They can have profiles. Um, and as I mentioned briefly, task difficulty can also be aligned with the scale. That's the first thing we're gonna look at and how those two things would align. So uh, almost anything you ask a student to do uh, can be associated with an actful level. If you've been study, studying the vocabulary for food and making meals, you might ask them to write a grocery list. That by definition is a novice level task. It's below sentence level, presumably familiar words, familiar foods. Now, if you got into exotic foods with exotic names, that probably would not be novice anymore. But a basic grocery list would be novice. And then um, you could have a student email another student writing a few sentences to describe themselves. That's intermediate. Uh, two major reasons it's intermediate. One, it's sentence level, not greater, not less. And two, it's very familiar content, very close to the person. And finally, for advanced, a true comparison where you actually um, elaborate in making a comparison between two things, such as the difference between high school and college classrooms or classes. Um, you can make a comparison at, even at the novice level, but it won't be elaborated and, and supported. Um, and I'm going to briefly navigate to the actful.org website, actfl.org and just show you how to get to the guidelines in, in case you don't. And I'm, we're gonna hear one of the videos there too. So when you get to the ACTFL website, you look at resources and publications. This is still loading. Oh, here it goes. Okay. And, um, now, I want to talk about the nature of the scale. As a testing person, obviously I do standardized testing, large scale testing, where you end up with numbers and statistics. The ACTFL approach is known as a criterion referenced approach, and it's an attempt to uh, be more directly meaningful. So when you say what level a person is, rather than saying they're a 79 on a scale of zero to 120 or something like TOEFL does, it's an attempt to put into words what it means to be at a level. So the criteria are spelled out in, in paragraphs, literally. So you see for advanced high, there are a couple paragraphs. To say what it means to be advanced mid, there are several paragraphs. Same for advanced low, same for most of the levels. So a question becomes, how can I possibly internalize this so that it's useful? And I'm going to show you a way to do that. Uh, of course, I do recommend reading through them just to get a sense, not to try to memorize, but just to get a sense for what's at each level. And then maybe here are a few samples. So under intermediate, if you click on view samples, you get, I think three videos or more. We're gonna listen to just a little bit of this guy named Luis. Um, we could start maybe by your telling me just a little bit about yourself, where you live, what you do, just a general introduction. Um, I live in Austin, Westchester, mm -hmm. and uh, I work in company in Austin, 
The name is uh, Merleis Carvin. I work on the, the machine computers. Mm -hmm. And have my family, you know, have one daughter. Uh, her name is Angela. And have um, brother and sister, too, you know. Okay. And when you're not working, what do you like to do in your free time? Uh, of course, you know, I have to have fun with uh, my daughter, you know, take to her to the park, you know, mm -hmm. and together with uh, my wife, you know. Great. You okay. Now, um, Actful shows that as an intermediate example. So apparently there is enough creation with language. He's creating sentences to answer questions. So at the intermediate level, you can ask and answer simple questions on very familiar topics. This is sort of an OPI format, oral proficiency interview. And notice the content of the questions. It's, it should be very familiar to him what his work is and, and questions about his family. So that is very typical for intermediate low and intermediate mid. So I, I just wanted to give you a sense of, um, of that. So um, he counts as, now what I do to internalize the guidelines, they used to hand out this kind of grid at training sessions. And um, see if I can get a pointer here. Ah, good. So you see the major actual levels here, except we don't have distinguished, but obviously if they were distinguished, they wouldn't be our students, they'd be teachers or something. Most of our students are down here. Sometimes we get advanced students. Um, I, I want to make the, some fundamental distinctions for the levels in these five categories. So in terms of the basic kind of task they can do, the novice is limited to basically listing things and naming things, making lists. Formulaic utterances really refers to memorized little chunks, okay? So they're not creating with language, that, that property of human language known as creativity that distinguishes us from a lot of animal communication systems. They don't have it yet. They just have memorized words and phrases. With the exception of the novice high person, uh, high by definition means they're sometimes or often capable of functioning at the next higher level. But basically this, this person at the novice level just can handle lists and naming. Intermediate, like Luis, simple conversations on familiar topics. At advanced, you can narrate and describe and compare and contrast with elaboration. That's, that's a big uh, part of it. You, and, you, know, you can describe at the novice level, but we don't call that description in the same sense as the advanced person. The advanced person can has enough language to elaborate and provide quite a few details. Um, what accuracy means, it's, it's really a lot of things that impact intelligibility. So you should be aware the novice speaker or writer sometimes is unintelligible, even to an experienced language teacher. An intermediate level speaker, on the other hand, could usually be understood by a teacher, but requires a sympathetic listener. So persons not accustomed to um, accented speech might have trouble with them. At the advanced level, that person should be intelligible to someone even if they've never met a second language speaker. That, that would be a nice level for our international teaching assistants, for example. And then this last category, it's called text type. It's a sim intentional simplification of discourse structure where the novice is limited to words and memorized phrases, intermediate, again, sentences, and advanced is capable of paragraph length discourse. Now, now not extended discourse where you have an introduction and, and relate all the paragraphs, but at least um, uh, a main idea and supporting ideas, kind of like the traditional essay. So hopefully um, that is more or less uh, imprinted in your in your minds as we do our upcoming tasks. 
So to do the kind of tasks I'm suggesting today, you have to have a sense of what your students' actual levels are. And you know, only if you're lucky, they will have taken a battery of actual tests. Michigan State was lucky and the University of Minnesota and a few other schools got a big proficiency grant and tested thousands of students. But obviously that's not what normally happens. Now you can, once we uh, talk about these can-do statements a little more, I bet you'll be able to use them um, with your students. So to do what I call guided self-assessment. So um, first of all, you wanna convince these students that learning to self-assess is very important. And a lot of people say it's a valuable skill for lifelong learning, uh, not just in language, but everything. So learning to assess yourself. So we, we will uh, take a look at those statements and then we, we will use them for a purpose they weren't written for. And that is, we're going to create some activities that could be used for learning uh, or assessment in the classroom. So, um, that's pretty much already said. And just, just in case you wonder if you see abbreviations like these, um, I'll try to say the, the level, name the whole level, but AH just means advanced high, ML is mid low, et cetera. So I just don't wanna to be too mysterious. So for example here, novice low and novice mid, this is what I'm referring to. We're about to look at these can do statements and examples. And uh, there's a few things that it would help to think about in advance. One is that the tasks you see in the functions for novice, low, and mid are truly novice level tasks and functions. Now you may say that's too obvious to say, why did you say that? And it's because at novice high, it's not true that you're dealing with novice tasks. As we look at these can-do examples, at least most of them appear to me to be at the intermediate level. And the reason, is that's, that's the definition of what it means to be novice high, that you can function at the intermediate level most of the time. So now if you really wanted to do a proper evaluation, you would give this person novice tasks to make sure they could do practically all of them. If they do, you then give them intermediate tasks. And what, what you often find is they can do lots of them, but not all of them. Um, now, at what point is, do you say they're novice high and not just novice mid? Or at what point do you say they're intermediate low? For intermediate low, they would pretty much have to do all of the maybe minor slip ups. Um, but the, um, who you, I would say literally different government agencies have different interpretations of where to draw the line. So the, the corresponding uh, number symbol for the government, they have a scale zero to five. Their zero plus is basically novice high. The plus indicating that the person is functioning on the one level uh, most of the time, like 80, 90% of the time. When I was first trained as an actful tester, it was more lenient. The trainer said more than half the time, but the, the point being that a novice high speaker can function at the intermediate level a lot, but they can't sustain it. They keep having these break, uh, what we call linguistic breakdowns. So that's what that's about. At the intermediate level, it works the same way. The intermediate low and mid tasks, or the examples are at the intermediate level, just like in the table I showed you, ask and answer simple questions. But at intermediate high, you're going to start to see advanced level functions and tasks because the definition of intermediate high is they're developing proficiency at the next higher level. They just can't sustain it, but they can uh, operate uh, quite a lot on that level. Okay. Um, I'm going to open the novice can do statements. Oh, I have to. Do this. Okay. And I'm going to scroll down to presentational speaking and writing. It's on page 12, so I know how to get there quickly. 
Here you see, for the benchmark, you see very general language, like I can present information on familiar topics. Those are like categories. What kind of information? Well, when you get to the examples, it's much more specific. The first one here is, I can say my name and age and where I live. That's, that's some information. The second one is phone number, home address, different types of information, okay? I can say some activities I do every day. Now, one of the things I'm suggesting is you take these examples and you expand these lists. So the, the first activity we'll do, I just want you to add two and it will be very easy. For example, um, when I see I can, I can say some activities I do every day, a simple variation is activities I do only on weekends or only a couple times a year. So, it's very, very easy to add to this list once you see those examples. So depending on which group you join, you can add to the novice low list or the novice mid. And now the other thing I wanted to do here was um, point out that these can-dos examples are literally lists. These are very clearly novice level um, things that they can do. But if you get over to the novice high, something's blocking my view, but um, I can describe where I work, something like that. You obviously are going to need to speak at the sentence level to describe anything like that. Or I can tell a peer or colleague something, what I do on the weekend. I can give biographical. These are definitely getting up into the intermediate range. So that's how you're gonna to have to interpret these. And when you talk to your students, if they're truly novice high, they should do all of these low and mid things. They should be able to say, yeah, I can do all of those, you know, possibly a slip up here and there. And then most of the novice high. So that's what that is. Intermediate um, presentational speaking also on page 12. Um, and again, the examples for low and mid are classic intermediate tasks, doing these very familiar activities uh, on familiar topics. Uh, but at intermediate high, you get, to, you get to more abstract, not abstract, but you get farther from self. So instead of talking about your family, you might talk about a neighborhood, a community, and, uh, and the things you're seeing under intermediate high which are really getting into advanced. So that's how those can-do um, examples are stated. And the, the, the last point I wanna make is you look at these, each topic is interesting. Uh, a story about a recent project, a story about a childhood memory. These are very interesting topics. They are not contextualized at all. And that's not a criticism for can-do. For can-do, that's just the way they do it. But if we're gonna convert these, these are great ideas for activities, we're going to need to contextualize them. So that's, that's what we're gonna work on today. Am I recording? I hope, yeah, I think so, good. So our first activity of two, you're going, in a minute, you're going to see uh, breakout rooms at the bottom of your screen. You'll click breakout rooms and you'll see these four choices, novice high, intermediate, mid, et cetera. And you click join to the right side of those. And that'll put you in a group. Um, if you want intermediate low, go in with the intermediate mids. And hopefully one person can report. Uh, we don't have time for long reports. like when we went through everybody's name and so on. But it would be nice to hear a few examples when we come out of this. So when I put you in these groups, I want you um, to read a few examples and discuss with each other, how are these level appropriate? And you know, so you might, if you're looking at novice high, you might say it's level appropriate because it's really an intermediate task. And it's an intermediate task because it involves more than a list, something like that. Can I ask a question, Daniel? Yeah, please. Um, 
So I'm not sure if this will matter for the activity or not, but I just want to um, check some assumptions. So we're, we're going to be working with uh, presentational speaking as the skill. And is that, is that correct? Yes. And then my other thought was, you know, when I think about an OPI interview, there is interaction there. It's not the type of interaction that would involve negotiation of meaning because the interview doesn't, the interviewer doesn't play that role, but is an OPI interviewed considered an example of presentational speaking, even though it has an interpersonal component? Well, certainly the classic OPI is just that. It's not, it doesn't get to that interpersonal yeah. okay. back and forth. Um, I'm sure that's coming though, and I'm sure they've already suggested how to get at that. But that's, it's known as a simulated conversation. It's really a way to elicit um, a presentation, monologic speech. Gotcha. Thank so you. I'm going to stop sharing now. And I don't want you to have to spend too much time on this activity. I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. So I'm going to also stop recording. I'll pause. Recording. I'm going to resume screen share. Can everybody hear me still? Okay, good. Hmm. Oh, did I? Um, can't find the record button now. I think that you're recording. You are recording. Yeah. It is recording? Yeah. Um, so what you see now is what I was talking about alignment. Let me get that pointer. Um, on the right side, the pyramid represents the student. On the left side, the level of difficulty of the task. If you have an intermediate low student, for example, you can present that student with a novice task. So that's below their capability, but I'm sure they'd appreciate it. And of course, it would be a good way to get them warmed up. Um, you could then give that same student an inter intermediate task, so a, a task at their level. And that's a good way to help them develop uh, fluency and breadth and go through different topics. Then you could probe, you could give them an advanced task. And you might, you know, you'll begin to see what they can do and what they cannot do at the advanced level. And that'll give you ideas for uh, things to teach. Uh, what I caution about is going up more than a level to superior because research shows that um, they will no longer give their best performance at that point. So especially if you're evaluating them, you would underestimate them. Their grammar would fall apart and, and so on. So I, I wouldn't go up too high, but that's what I meant by alignment. And it's, it's just pretty logical. Uh, if you give them a task lower than they're capable of, that's good for warm up. same level, develop fluency and breadth. One level higher, you help pull them up and find out what they still need. Two levels up is risky. Um, I'm going to um, go through the performance assessment piece um, rather quickly, but hitting the highlights. Performance-based assessments contrasted with um, indirect assessments such as multiple choice testing. And you see down here, a young woman driving a car. This would be a performance assessment, obviously. Um, if you take another example, tennis, you can learn to play tennis from a book, but that's a very indirect way. You would be better off performing. Uh, this person's not reading, he's watching, but he's still not performing. Finally, down here on the right, the student is performing tennis and can be evaluated and can work on their game. There's even this, that's di the direct approach. This, this is known as a semi-direct approach over here where it's sort of artificial, but better than multiple choice. So 
these are the characteristics I really want to talk about. Um, you've got to contextualize these ideas for these themes we've looked at. Try to be authentic, task-based, and learner-centered. I'll go through these um, one at a time. Give them meaningful context. Organize multiple tasks around a theme rather than topic hopping. Use a theme and variation approach. We're going to use the theme keeping a journal. Another theme could be study abroad. Uh, keeping a journal, the different segments could be uh, today I want you to write about what makes a beautiful day. And then tomorrow you can write about what, what makes a tough day. We'll look at more examples. Study abroad could have variations such as things you do before you go abroad, such as choosing a program, things you do to prepare for the trip, such as packing and so on. Uh, role plays are great, but you, you should have the student ideally play the role of themselves. That's the most authentic thing you can do. Contrast that with something non-authentic, like imagine you're the king of a country and you're super rich, what would you do with your money? That might be fun once in a while, um, but it's, it's not ideal for developing early levels of proficiency. Um, another example of authenticity, it's not very authentic at the novice level to say name the circled days on a calendar, but you could contextualize that a bit and say, okay, I want you to meet your conversation partner twice a week. Now tell me which two days of the, name the two days of the week you would like to meet for conversation practice. So now, even though it's novice level below sentence level, you're giving them a real reason to use the language. Of course, be age appropriate, culturally appropriate, have them play the role of themselves. Now, I um, gave you a copy of the mini guide, um, this thing, developing speaking and writing tasks, blah, blah, blah. You can look at that in detail on your own. I recreated page six so we could talk about it. This is a good example of an activity that's contextualized, authentic task space and learner centered. It's got a cool theme, keeping a journal. Another theme would be study abroad, but this is keeping a journal. It's set up contextualize your teachers giving you a chance to earn extra credit by keeping a journal you decide to take advantage of the offer and you get started some clear instructions segment one is a great day this is what we're going to do in class today write about a great day here's some more contextualization with regard to the situation your teacher tells your teachers should be singular, tells you to think about what a really great day is like for you and write about it in your journal. There's guidance provided. Um, take a minute to answer the following questions in, in whatever language, we can talk about the language later. Target, it could be the target language or English. Um, think about your surroundings. What do you, uh, where are you? What do you see? What do you hear? What do you smell? What do you do? This is all the warm up pre writing stuff. And then the prompt is coming describe your great day and more guidance. You might want to include a description of your surroundings, what you're doing, who you're with, how you feel, what you hear, what you see. So this can be very guided for, say, intermediate low or intermediate high or even intermediate mid. You, you, you can be very explicit. I want uh, eight to 12 sentences. And voila, you have um, a great activity. Um, uh, I mentioned that, uh, you know, you, you could have them on the next day do the same activity, but instead of writing what makes a good day, what makes a lousy day, or um, describe a, a family outing, or a rainy day, a nice evening alone with a friend, you, this list could be very quickly expanded. And, and that's a lot of people think it's better to stay on a theme rather than topic hopping, hopping all around the place. So um, if you create such a template, you can create it in English or in, in your target language. Just make sure there's contextualization at the top and give the student a reason to use the language. You get extra credit in this case. Invite the writer to show a sufficient range of vocabulary. Well, all that guidance 
uh, seemed to help um, quite a bit, reminding them of things they could write about um, and try to elicit sentences, not lists, even directly ask for sentences. Okay, so um, I do want you to, um, I'm gonna give you only five minutes for this because we're gonna close with rubrics and benchmarks, but um, that page six or that slide, when you look at this later, you can capture that slide. That's a great template. So think of using that uh, for all kinds of variations. So what I'm going to do, stop sharing again, get out of the PowerPoint, pause the recording. Okay, welcome back. Um, now we only have five minutes technically, and I don't know what's going to happen at six. All this may just disappear. I'm hoping not. If if you do have to go at six, of course, just um, click leave the meeting. Um, I'm going to make my PowerPoint available to whoever to whoever wants it. Um, my my goal for you now is that you can at least figure out how to use that template. It would take a couple hours to make a good assessment, but how to use it means I could. I could change the theme and I could write different segments that are different variations on the theme. And I know one group already went up a level to advanced. So that's that's great. So I'm I'm recording again. I'm going to screen share again and show you some rubrics. So you've got a performance now, and it's what we would call a rateable sample if it's, you know, you've asked for sentences. So how would you evaluate it? Here's, um, here's a rubric with two parts, discourse and vocabulary. It was really designed to elicit sentences. So a lot of this refers to sentences, but you'll notice uh, zero, one, two, you're not getting sentences. So you would only get zero, one or two points. At three, level three on this scale, you see some sentences, but they're mixed with fragments. So it looks to me, if you wanted someone to be intermediate, a true intermediate, they would have to get four or five on this discourse scale. For the vocabulary scale, it uses the word adequately fulfills requirements at two, but not at one. So it looks like you need at least two on vocab, four on discourse. So you would need six out of eight up here to be at that level, if you were using it to determine a level. Whoops. Um, so this, this rubric I think is in the, in the pamphlet as well. Um, now what I want, the last point I wanna make about benchmarks is when you look at a lot of rubrics, language sometimes is just not adequate. You cannot fully specify what it means to be at a level. Or put another way, there is no such thing as a standalone rubric. You have to go get, give this task and then get lots of examples of what you intended for four, what you intended for three. And then they can look at those benchmarks and see what, which, it's more, which it's closer to. So let me show you a, a speaking task for low level students. Um, we give them this storyboard and it's, it's very simple. It's a guy with a cereal box on a sunny day, opens a cereal, pours it, spills some, picks up what he spilled, closes a box and he ends up eating the cereal. Um, I have two, um, here's, here's a rubric for that. It doesn't matter what the categories are. It ha happens to be syntax or grammar, vocabulary. It's kind of traditional, but you see points are one to four in between two and three, a big decision is made. If they get three or more, they end up in level one. If they get less, they're in the lower level. If you had time to look at this, you would notice below three is below sentence level. Above three is sentence level. Um, these are, I could play them, but I, th these are the transcriptions of how students respond. For benchmark two, you see they had a lot of false starts, but you don't get complete sentences. That's why this is a two. The benchmark for four, this is what she said. There is someone who will wake up early. Mm -hmm. 
So you don't need to hear that, but this is what she said. Look at all those sentences, one after another came out. Both of these students placed below level two with our main placement. They then took this test and we were able to sort them out into who was at sentence level and who wasn't. We had a lot of twos, a lot of threes and fours. And if you've listened to a few of them, it becomes very easy to rate new students. So then student A came in, we found out he wasn't, he was more like the first student you heard. And student B was more like the woman, but not quite as good. So he ends up being a three. So these are sample performances at each level. This one is also about it. Um, now I'm going to show you, I'm gonna jump really quickly to the last exam. This is an essay test in Greece. Thousands of kids a year take this test. And if you read this rubric, don't try to read it now, but it's in the PowerPoint. You could rate essays, but you would have a lot of trouble deciding, is this a three or is this a four? If this is all you had to work with. Again, no rubric is truly a standalone uh, rubric. So we've created sense, uh, sets of benchmarks and we even make them public so the students can see them. We put the prompts for the essay and then we start with the lowest level. This is a, a failing essay. And the comments over here uh, mirror the rubric. So there's comments about the grammar, the vocabulary, the development, and the mechanics. And you find this one is uh, almost not intelligible. You get to the next one, it's better, but it's, it's doing things like recycling the prompt. It's just uh, using memorized words and chunks not much original there. And we have five levels. Three of the levels are passing, so we, they tend to get longer. But what's cool about these, five different points on the scale, everyone is in 100% agreement. But it took a while to find these essays. So what you would have to do when you give assignments, start collecting them and, and ask yourself, what, if I have a five-point scale, what's a prototypical one? What's a prototypical two? and you get representation of each level. That's the one thing you can get everyone to agree on are those benchmarks. Then when you start rating students in the future, you'll find the problem is they come in between the benchmarks. So you're still not gonna be sure, but you're gonna be much more accurate. You'll say, is it more like the two or more like the three? And so I hope you know what I mean by having samples of, of the writing. That's what makes it possible to do um, so-called subjective rating. It can actually be very reliable. Okay, now we're gonna catch our breath. I actually had, I was looking for a picture with 20 of these athletes and I was gonna say, this is us, at least we look fit. Uh, um, I'm gonna make my conclusions and whoever can stay can stay. We're running out of time here. So we did go through everything. I definitely wanna thank Hanada, Sarah, and Jianhua uh, for setting all this up and for you uh, taking out your Friday. I'm gonna stop the screen share and see who's still here. Um, so I wanna know, did it make sense what I said about not just having a rubric, but having samples at each level in the rubric that somehow are, are more, they're not more meaningful than the, the descriptors in the rubric, but those two things work together, right? That, that's how we do it at Michigan State in, in any case. So I, I wanna open it up to, to questions. What is the purpose that you're describing? Is it to train a group of instructors to think about grading in the same way, or are you talking about creating larger scale uh, exams for larger consumption? What I'm trying to do is borrow what we do in large scale testing and make it work in the classroom. So uh, even if you're alone, you can do this. You, you create from that template, your performance, start collecting performances. And then if your scale is one to five, put them in piles and you'll find that some of them you're not so sure about, others you're very sure. 
And I would say aim for the, you know, start selecting ones that seem to be from the middle of the band. So if you have a bunch of threes, some are weak threes, some are strong threes, go for the middle. So you're gonna end up with two or three examples at each scale level that's totally typical of that level. And then later when you grade, you have two things to look at. You can look at your rubric as you consider what mark to give it, and you look at your benchmarks. And very quickly, you eliminate all but two. So it, it always works like that. You can easily eliminate all but two when you go, it's, it's between a four and a five, or it's between a two and a three. And then you just decide, you re read the language in the rubric, you look at the examples, and those two things together are the basis of, of a judgment which I can tell you is a tester is psycho psychometrically much more reliable than just not having those samples. So even if you're by yourself, save these samples from semester to semester, but most likely you go to conferences, you have colleagues, you can at least get one colleague to say, hey, do you agree with this rank order, these five? And then, you know, so, that, that, that's how we do the, the rating. And a lot of our teachers do both. They do a large scale rating for large scale tests and then they teach their own classes and, and collect benchmarks for their own class. Can I ask one more question? I don't mean to dominate. I just, I'm like, I have, you know, it's, you stimulated my brain, which is a good thing. Um, when I think about making a rubric, um, so what I'm, and this, I wanna check an assumption with you mm -hmm. that I'm taking. Way. An assumption that I'm taking away is that I adapt a rubric. Um, normally, I would have thought to show the complete scale of performance. So I would create a rubric that would go from novice to probably advanced. Um, but are you saying that you would want to tailor your, your rubric to capture what you would expect the range of performances to be within your class? With, so like what would be the top, the top level for intermediate or something like that for intermediate low? Or... This is a very good question. And, and the, here's the point. That actual scale, it, it's too big. It's too stretched. It, I mean, it's good for the, what they use it for. But once you're in the classroom, most of your students are in a more narrow range. The template is meant to target one level or two at the most, two at, so maybe intermediate, mid, or low, depending on how many points you get. Once you narrow the range, then you need another scale, zero to five, which has nothing to do with uh, advanced or superior. You, you've now compressed thing, you're zooming in actually on the actual scale and you can do this in the classroom so thank you yeah and it, and you're going to have to first create the activity then collect the samples and see how much of a range you have and decide where you want to draw the line and then and then and just give it a few not you can have a scale of zero to three zero to five i, I wouldn't go much over five it's it's then it's hard to agree on the order but um, it's very sensible, I think, on the one we had to say six is, is a true intermediate, six out of eight points on, on that one. So you're creating your rubric after you've collected samples. In a sense, the very first time you do it, you're creating, yeah. you're building your rubric based on what you got the first time, and yeah. then you zoom in as you get experience. Yeah, that's, we say we created the rubric empirically, <laughs> but... That, that makes it sound good, but that is, but you have an idea ahead of time of what you want because you know what the requirements of the level are. Yeah, and now you just have to see what students can do. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that, yeah, yeah. I think this, this kind of uh, suggestion for the, for the rubrics is, is wonderful because for the actual scales for classroom assessment, sometimes it's not quite useful because for taking uh, Chinese, Three or one, for instance, the students come with inter, probably intermediate high within the one semester. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you do the actual assessment, you may end up with intermediate high, but with the finer uh, di the distinction by using this kind of classroom based assessment, it really helps us to know the students' progress. And for the students, it's almost like a learning guide this well-designed rubrics. I really like the idea. I think one thing 
we can do in Ohio 5 is, for instance, my Chinese colleagues, we can get together probably because we're using similar textbooks or students at a similar mm -hmm. level. Mm -hmm. If we can develop a set of rubrics for assessing students' progress in reading or interpersonal, say interpersonal speaking or inter interpersonal writing, mm -hmm. I think I like how his comments, I think in some way we start with uh, rubrics and by analyzing the samples, we're kind of kind of refining yeah. the rubrics, which becomes more useful yeah. either as an assessment tool mm -hmm. or as a learning guide. I, I really like the idea of your the, the guidelines you give us for creating and developing these classroom-based assessment rubrics. Yeah, well, that, that's a great way to put it. That um, I'm, I'm sorry we ran short of time. I, in the beginning, I just didn't wanna be so impersonal that we didn't introduce ourselves. But um, I think this is actually enough, you know, to get you started. And um, I, now that I think about it, I'll have to talk to Sarah about sharing the PowerPoint because Ohio 5 is now owning this, this thing. So I'll have to find out what I can share. But I would certainly be happy to share, you know, and exchange ideas through email. Um, but, um, but to me, you got it. You got what I wanted you to get. And it, it would take some work, but not a ton of work. It, it, and these things are so reusable, you know, and so easy to, to um, mo uh, modify and make them, keep them fresh every semester. Yeah, I think we have learned so much. I think, thank you for giving us the guide and also the other materials, I think with this video, and then also the, 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 the guide for designing. I think yeah, that, to... that mini guide, it was the last thing I did when I was at the University of Minnesota with those other people listed. And uh, at the time I thought, ah, who's gonna look at this? But you know, that was many years ago and we, we've developed technology to the point that I thought that, how could that be relevant? And when I reread it, I said, this is what's missing. When we do all our online assessments, we, we kind of lost track of the basics. And to me, that mini guide really captures the basics of performance-based assessment. So um, uh, do, do spend some time looking through that and then feel free to, to email me for ideas. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. actually my question. You know, how do you do in during this uh, Zoom time, this online thing, how do you evaluate this performance-based and task-based uh, mm -hmm. approach? You know, some of the Title VI language resource centers um, have actually at Michigan State, we had one called CLEAR. They spent a lot of time developing web-based resources for proficiency uh, learning and, and assessment. So there are some already out there if you search for them or you might be able to develop your own, but the, the, the internet technology is, is uh, so general that it can work with anything you you want it to do, but you, you have to know what you want to do. That's why I think this mini guide is very useful. Uh, yeah, I like the idea that you have a kind of sample there to mm -hmm. demonstrate what they can do is this. The act for was a little too dry if you read the, just the text, you know, doesn't yeah. really make sense to many um, if with all these uh, concrete examples. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Those. So those can do's. This is the other takeaway. If you contextualize them, they become much more useful for other types. Yeah, of I agree. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think uh, we're a little bit over the time, but thank mm -hmm. you, Professor Reed. I think for people who have uh, other things to do, you can leave, and then I do have a little. Uh, evaluation that takes a few minutes. You can, you can do it now or you can do it later. I will send this uh, link uh, by email. Uh, I think uh, we'll, we'll conclude this session. I think Professor Reed, if you don't mind, for people who have additional questions, we're gonna stay here for another five minutes. And for people who have to leave, and then we'll conclude this. Um, thank you again, Professor okay. Reed. Thanks everybody. Thanks for joining me.
where where do we get the PowerPoint, Professor Reed? The 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 video uh, uh, will be available from Ohio Five okay. uh, uh, website. I'm going to send you guys the link. Mm -hmm. uh, when Professor Reed sent it to Sarah, Sarah will create a link, and that will be included.